honestly speaking, most techies, uh, people to this day don't know what the actual profession is, right? Sign off as well. The underpinning issue was uh, some private equity business. That's where, that's where the merit of argument uh, uh, Julius is that, you know, because of that restriction, black people might never open a bank. And it's valid. Yeah, yeah man. South Africa Development Bank, man. <laughs> not, not VBS, man. Can I get open If you want savings for retirement in the purest form yeah. and enjoy, to enjoy the tax benefits that come with it, yeah. you have to probably invest. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have an actual, an actual, actuarial, actuarial <laughs> professional. Thanks, 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 uh, Rockle Fatsi. Yeah, so my name is uh, Kutlano Mukhele. Um, I'm an actuarial professional, and I think uh, perhaps I'll be talking a bit about what the profession entails, how to get into it, the types of opportunities that could be there, and what I do as an actuarial profession, you know, uh, my job or and also maybe give me some of my employment um, history uh, and perhaps answer I mean, any other questions that perhaps you could be interested in yeah. or that you might feel that people would be interested in knowing or any other tips that perhaps I can give in that regard. The actuarial profession to become an actuary, what they call a fellow member of the Actuarial Society of South Africa or a fellow actuary, yeah. a fully qualified actuary, you, you basically need to complete a certain number of exams uh, okay. through a professional, recognized professional body, right? There is one in South Africa called the Actuarial Society of South Africa. Okay. However, what would happen is that the, the varsity course would facilitate that qualification or facilitate those steps towards qualifying as a fellow member. A couple of the exams that you write in varsity yeah. are actually earmarked as exemption exams. And those ones, then you go and apply to the professional body and they give you their credit to those modules. Okay. So there are about 17 modules that you need to cover or exams that you need to cover. 17? 17. With the, actual, with the Actuarial Society of South Africa, uh, the, the, the UK uh, professional bodies as well have yeah. a similar exam structure. In fact, we borrowed the, the, the exam structure from them. From them. And the Australian bodies are similar as well. The American, the society of actuaries in America, the American society and professional bodies are a bit different yeah. in how they structure the exams. In mainland Europe, it's a bit different as well. And how the profession is seen, there's a bit different. It's more technical and more about the numbers, whereas in South Africa, it's more all-encompassing and business-minded and uh, more financial, yeah. right? So the, the, the actual profession at its core uh, is a risk management profession. Right now, there there are a lot of practice areas that actuaries can can work in, okay. but at its core, the question that someone in the actual profession has to answer, right, is: Is an organization uh, funded, or do they have enough assets, or will they be able to meet the liabilities that that particular organization has? Now, with the actuarial profession, right, traditionally, actuaries would work in life insurance mm -hmm. or retirement funds. What they would do there is calculate the liabilities that the life insurance company has or the retirement fund has. Okay. So a life insurance company or, a, or even an insurance company, yeah. you know, that liability is an obligation. They make a promise to you. You pay me premiums. If you die, I pay out this to your beneficiaries. Yeah. You pay me premiums. If you crash your car and you've got a valid claim, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll okay. pay you um, whatever the claim amount is, right? Now, that promise, that obligation, that liability is a liability. Right. It's seen yeah. as a liability. It, it is a li yes, it's a liability. It's a promise yeah. that I've, it's a promise that that organization has made to you. Yes. In a retirement fund, uh, traditionally retirement funds used to take contributions of members, invest them. When you retire, we're going to pay you a certain amount of pension until you die. Okay. Right. So that promise, that obligation, there's a liability. Right. Yeah. Now, what complicates it and maybe makes the profession quite a niche and a comp and, and, and a difficult one to get into yeah. is that we are you're looking at. We're sitting today, I'm making a promise about uncertain future uh, yeah. events. If I'm giving you a life insurance product, it's certain you're going to die at some point, but I don't know when you're going to die. Mm -hmm. That's the uncertainty that then you're dealing with, right? If I'm selling you a non-life insurance policy, policy yeah. um, I don't know when you're going to crash. I don't know what the size of the claim is going to be, mm -hmm. right? Now, what an actuary would do then is then, right, using whatever sort of method would be suited to the scenario that they have to calculate what the value of that liability might be, right? Okay. And then once you've calculated that, the value of that liability, do you have enough assets as an organization to meet these obligations, right? But then also on the back of that, there's this liability or there's this promise I'm, I'm, I'm making to you. 
Yeah. But I have to price that promise, right? Pricing, that's pricing of a premium, right? I have to price yeah, that promise. Yeah. If I say to you, if your car crashes, I'm going to pay you out. I need to calculate how much you need to pay me to buy that cover from you, right? So that's also what complicates the profession. So, 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 so at its very core, so those are traditional, traditional, traditional uh, fields that actually used to work in as life insurance and retirement funds, right? Yeah. But now, then they moved in the last decade, couple of decades, into uh, medical aid schemes and um, and, and non life insurance, so short term insurance, general insurance, yeah. right? And slowly they moved into finance and banking as well, right? As banking regulations have also become a bit stricter and tighter, there are complications in terms of the, 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 the balance sheet management of a bank and also the capital that a bank needs to hold, right? Yeah. And, and that's where the skills that come with qualifying or working in the profession become quite important right but then maybe to take it back a step back sorry um uh, before we veer off a bit into the traditional roles Mm -hmm. so to to get into the varsity programs that facilitate or fast track your qualifying as a as a as a fellow as a fellow member of the actual society of south africa as fully qualified actually at vits i know back in the day it could have changed now but at vits they required you to get into the program to have an a in maths higher grade at the time an a in english higher grade at the time um, and an a in english first language higher grade yeah. and then an a in, in physical science higher wow. grade back in our day that they, they don't have the grades now anymore but so that talks to the the skills or demonstrating that you might have the core skills or abilities or the aptitude to be able to qualify or to work as an actuary right, right? Mm-hmm. definitely no definitely not maths literacy no <laughs> Almost everybody's doing maths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they not, don't qualify. No, you definitely wouldn't qualify for maths. Right. So you have to be, you have to be very mathematically astute. And I don't think maths let talk to that. Uh, if we're being frank, yeah. in terms of, I mean, maths is quite obvious. I mean, if it's if it's a, if it's a profession in finance, you can imagine that there's it's, it's a lot of numbers, there's a lot of technical yeah. work there. English, surprisingly, but a lot of people might, when they think of the profession, that seems very mathematical and numbers heavy. English is very important because. We, when you work as an actually in your daily job yeah. right you communicate you actually communicate way more in english than you'd ever uh, do in numbers right yeah. i mean when you used to write reports you'd find that 90 percent of your report is words right so you need to communicate and the instruction also coming from when you're working in a company the instruction coming from your boss the instruction coming from policyholders the instruction coming from anywhere it's in words you have to take those words interpret what they mean identify the problem yeah go run your numbers spreadsheet or whatever and when you communicate the results thereof and the implications to someone that's in words as well right and you have to communicate in a language that suits the audience so that's why english is very important as well right and then and then and then and then just to to complete why physical science was important was Mm -hmm. because uh, if you do do physical science at school you'd know that some of the problem solving element in physical science particularly paper one is the type of problem solving that you might need uh, to be proficient at in the profession. So you can take you can take a paragraph, a scenario, yeah. um, take what's relevant from it, run your calculations, uh, and then get an answer, right? That that skill that uh, or that aptitude that one picks up in physical science is one that uh, is important uh, to be proficient in the profession. And 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 at Vits, the the school would would accept a B in English, right? It wasn't strict A. They would accept a B in, in special circumstances they'd expect us, they, they could accept a C. When I was working in consulting, I I mean I wrote a lot of reports. 90% of the report is words, right? So you have to be and, and you have to communicate effectively to the audience, right? So that's a very important skill. One of the exams or modules you have to pass to be an actual it's an exam called co- uh, communications, right? And it's got it's actually the exam that has one of the higher file failure rates actually oh. right and the exam it's it's it might sound something it might sound silly in the exam the exam that i wrote they, they give a scenario like a, a policy holder wrote this email complaining about this respond to them and respond to them in a language that they understand right as to why you know they I think they, they they withdrew something from from some investment and why you know is the amount this much i thought it was going to be this much now you might take it for granted that how difficult it might be for someone who's very technically astute in numbers um, to communicate at the level of someone who's a layman, yeah. right? So that becomes very important. And also, besides, let's say you're not even talking to directly to policyholders. If you're working in a company and you're actually in a big life insurance company, you might find that 
the CEO is not an actor. Maybe it's someone mm. who's a could be a CA, you know? So his technical knowledge of some some things in life insurance are not the same as yours, as much as he's a finance person. So right. you need to be able to communicate effectively to him, right? To frame his decision making, whatever, you know, to be very useful, right? So to get into the VITS program, that's what you needed. Um, the UCT program, I'm not too sure. U University of Victoria, I'm not too sure what the requirements are, but I don't think they change much, right? Okay. And obviously, you have to have an overall high score. And um, I think, yeah, the overall high score uh, or to get into a BSc program or BBSc yeah. uh, that they call it UCT, right? And the three, so the three schools uh, that offer the most comprehensive programs for actuaries in South Africa is VITS, UCT, those are the top two. Yeah. And then UP has been coming along quite nicely in terms of the number of actuaries they produce. Yeah. That they produce. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So UP, UKZN, uh, Free State, Stellenbosch is not too Stellenbosch is not too bad either, uh, in terms of producing actuaries and comprehensive actuarial science programs. Um, yeah, and then you go through your varsity program. Certain exams you write in the varsity program are earmarked as exemption exams, meaning that if you get a certain mark in those exams, you can go to a professional body and say, "I've completed this module, this module, this module, this module." Through the exams I wrote in varsity. But even then, when you go through to honors, you still have to write about four or five exams after honors. Even if you get all the exemptions in varsity and you have to complete three years at least work, uh, work-based skills. No, no, that, that, that's just work-based skills. Work-based skills, um, well, in our generation, and it changes uh, sometimes also the, 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 the educational framework at Tenya Change Ahanyan, it evolves over time. But work-based skills, all you have to do is, it's almost like articles, but it's not really articles. You just have to, it's broken into a series of questions of things that you should encounter, in your in your work you know to, to demonstrate work experience so that's getting through varsity and, that, and i think also what 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 going through the varsity program does is that you can actually when you apply for a job and you've passed um, your psc or you with honors in actuarial science yeah. you can then become employable right they know that you've done certain core technical subjects that we can actually employ you uh, to do a certain job you know within the profession itself yeah so is it easy to just find jobs after completing all of this we, we, you're fairly employable uh once you you, you complete uh, let's say your, your degree uh, in varsity you, you 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 won't struggle as much as let me put it this way you won't struggle nowhere near the average south african you won't struggle you won't struggle as much as other varsity uh, gradu graduates right so it's up, it's definitely on the upper in the upper percentiles of employability once you once you've completed your studies. Have we seen doctors being unemployed? Lining up. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, they 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 structure it systematically. The things are different, right? Yeah. With doctors, uh, you, your first employer, everyone who's everyone who does, who's, who's done medicine, your first employer for your first three years is yeah. going to be the state. So that the issue then with the employability is the state not being able to. True to pay them and, and not having enough in their coffers in the Department of Health to be able to pay those doctors, right? Your employ your 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 people who employ actuarial students, it's private sector, right? Yeah. That's very different than systematically in terms of employability, right? If the private sector can absorb those people coming out of there, right? And for certain uh, financial services businesses, right, then then you then then that 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 struggle or the issue that doctors have is very different as long as the private sector can absorb them and as well because of the strong technical aptitude or technical skills that an actuarial student or a professional should have it's not you you, you can they can you can be attracted you can attract other jobs that aren't traditional actuarial jobs yeah right so you find that some people who studied actuarial science can work in a bank as a trader you know someone who studied actuarial science might be more attractive to a bank yeah. as a trader but you don't necessarily have to have studied actuarial science to be a trader right you don't have to have studied it to work in certain jobs but you might be more attractive because of the type of skill that that, that comes you have, with. Yeah. yeah can you give a bit on why you actually pursued this yeah this career yeah so so i mean i'm sure i'll talk to my own work history i think maybe i was just giving an, an overall background of the yeah. profession itself and you know the types of jobs you can get and so forth so uh, look and i and i guess and how I came to pursue this, and I guess these types of initiatives um, would actually aid in actually educating more of young uh, young people, giving them exposure. Right? Honestly speaking, most techies uh, people to this day, 
don't know what the actual profession is, right? So you can imagine how bad this was in 2002. Mm -hmm. So 2002, I got introduced to to this profession by my dad. Yeah. At the time, I was thinking of being an engineer. As uh, so most mathematically astute students said, uh, we were probably good at physics as well. Either go there or go in the CA route, yeah. right? Um, so he was like, no man, there's this profession called actuarial science. And he didn't even know what it was like. Yeah. Oh, but you know, you need to be good at maths. And that's, that's all they say, you need to be good at maths and it pays well, you know? And then a cousin of mine who, who was, uh, who was seven years older than me, right? So yeah. she had started working and she, and she had gone to UCT. So she also knew a bit about it, had heard about it. Like, I think it, it could suit you because you got the skill set, the strong skill set for it, you know? So there, there, there it is. That's the long and short of why someone would have pursued it, you know. Yeah. And and look, let's not beat around the bush. I think with us, us black people, the lack, that lack of exposure, I think also, you know, financial viability or how well something pays as a profession. Yeah. It's very important. Let's not hide let's not That's hide true. behind that, you know. It's a, it's a so, motivation. Exactly. It's a yeah. big motivation, right? So I mean I didn't know what it was. So the first day at varsity, I think fifty pits. But most of the Daki students they didn't know. Um, so I, I hope that is that it's a proper term. Use, you know? It's a proper term. <laughs> so, yeah. so most of the black students didn't know. Uh, they didn't know, you know. So our, our, our lecturer is like, says, what, "What do you think? What What do you think an actuary is now?" So he lists. He lists. He's like, "Is it a mathematician? Is it a, a Is it an engineer? Is it a?" I think he mentioned four things, and then the last one was a businessman. Now. And then he said the most accurate response is businessman because you work in business. It's a yeah. profession in business. And, Institute financial institutions, right? So that's more accurate. He said engineers probably the second most uh, accurate um, description yeah. because you know it's a financial, you're a financial engineer type thing, you know. Um, and, and I think I think this this initiative will probably go to aid a lot of, and especially black students because yeah. I think white a lot of white. Uh, you found that I actually found our first year class that a lot of white stu white students actually had parents who were actuaries as well. Wow. qualified actuaries as well so they had exposure to that they knew about Earlier it yeah. in their lives yeah. a lot of jewish students they've got a very close and small community they had they had mentors in their community or that people in their community were actually so they actually knew a lot about the profession as well you know so so basically that's how i got into it you know so the 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 the, the, the dropout rate when it comes to everyone white or black how bad is it Everyone who got into the, the program at Vits, almost everyone, they were averaging A's at school, and yeah. and people still struggle and don't get through. You know, people drop and take other courses, you know. Yeah. And even if you do get through, just to give an example, so we started at, we started in first year there was a class around 180, uh, third year was we are down to 90, but of that 90, some even repeated. Oh. So only about only about 70 were straight cohort that went straight from first year to third year straight without oh. having to repeat right yeah. and then some will go to honors and so forth but you can imagine that these are people who always students coming into this and still yeah. struggles right so there's definitely no way that you you take someone who has a c student and it can happen there can be re there can be other reasons that make you not uh, get c's in high school at, at, uh, i mean c's in maths or yeah. i mean a's in maths and a's in physics at school other structural issues i, I get that but generally you will struggle. It won't work. It was not gonna work. There's way more people after getting their qualification, um, after getting their degree, yeah, ne, who don't complete all of the exams to qualify as an actuary through the professional body. Yeah, right. I myself for years have been struggling with the last exam. It's I'm just so despondent about it, right? <laughs> it's yeah, it's yeah. that's the, it, it, it's it's the fellowship exam, like the last 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 yeah. last number, you know. But I've completed enough exams for a, a designation called an associate. Mm -hmm member of the actual, of the actual um, society of south africa yeah. but when you qualify fully you become a fellow member okay. so well, that's what that's what you left with so i'm left with the one exam that yeah. one exam. yeah out yeah. of the, all those 17 yeah one yeah so the, the some of a lot of the exams the latter exams now, yeah. and i explain the exam structure the latter exams uh, the examiners are, are actual professionals that are working in the profession right yeah. They're actual examiners, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no gatekeeping at all. So I don't think there's gatekeeping at that level. Gatekeeping, the only serious level of gatekeeping, I think, that keeps black people or, or is a struggle for black people is the fact that you get, you have to be very proficient in English, right? That's 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 one way of gatekeeping. And if it's not your first language, I mean, we did English on first language level, yeah. but I've seen a lot of 
students uh, who come from provinces, your more rural provinces who didn't do English as a first language and they struggled a lot, especially in the latter parts of actual science in your honors years and so forth. They struggled quite a bit because of that, right? So it's, 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 it, it does, and this could be applied across a lot of professions, I guess, as well. The fact that, you know, the, the business language is, is, is English and if you can't communicate effectively in it, you might struggle a bit in it. So, so to get back to the point that there's, there's so many people who've got the degrees or honors in actuarial science that then go on and never actually even write exams after that. But they can still, they're still very employable and still work, you know, I mean, many industries and many businesses. Some one of my closest friends, I mean, he stopped after he got his honors and he's now working in investment consulting because, I mean, of, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the subjects that you encounter then also give you a good understanding or technical knowledge of investments and investment classes and asset classes and all that thing just to give an example yeah. so from people who start out first year to people who qualify as as as, as fellow members of the actual society the dropout rate between then and there is very high yeah. but if you do get an honors you are very, you're fairly employable you know uh, if you do a, um, get an honors in actuarial science or you get the degree at, at uct which is four years which includes an honors year for duchies yeah like let's say there's 500 students how many are Dutchies? I'd say 50% of the students were black, 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 not B, black, yeah. like black, 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 black African. And then there were quite a number of Indians as well. And obviously um, white people, not a lot of coloreds, but yeah, but about 50% black African, 40 to 50%. Even if you don't think you should do it, yes and no, but just like you're saying with the CA, you have to get CA essay to sign off certain bits of work or sign off on certain reports or bits of work or whatever. There are statutory, uh, there are statutory, statutory roles and jobs that only a fellow member can 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 sign off or complete, right? And not even just a fellow member. Sometimes when you have to sign off on evaluation of a retirement fund, so to speak, you need to have a evaluator certificate. So not only are you a fellow member, you have to have completed a certain a co-signing of a certain number of valuations before you get a certificate to sign off of that, on that, right? So there's certain statutory roles that you can't do just by having the technical proficiency, right? In terms of the job market also, there's certain... I wouldn't say that you have the same amount of opportunities, right? But there are certain things you can't do without having qualified to a certain level, right? More and more when regulation and legislation changes, you might find that, um, particularly in the insurance industry, right, you find that there's certain uh, report, reporting that needs to be done by the head of the actuarial control uh, function of that organization. That person has to be a fellow member, you know, who's going to be there. So, uh, but you find that a lot of people who work under him or report to him, maybe he might not have qualified, you know, to the actual running of the numbers, but he's the person accountable for it when he signs off on it, you know. Like someone who values a retirement, the valuator of a retirement fund. I might be doing the calculations for the valuator, but if he signs off and says this fund is in a financially sound position, and it's not, turns out it's not, it's his name, you know, he's the one who's going to, you know. Okay. So far in your career, what do you specialize in? Uh, so, uh, you specifically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I started off uh, working for, uh, so I had an interesting start to my career. I started off working as um, in a consulting firm. So in this consulting firm, like I mentioned, a couple of practice areas actually is working. We used to consult across the board, right? Yeah. We consulted on life insurance, which life insurance operations, non-life insurance operations. We consulted on medical aid schemes. We consulted, we did a banking project, I remember, once to, uh, we consulted to them. Uh, can I can this development bank. Can I can this development bank. Why am I forgetting its name now? Yeah, yeah, man. South Africa Development Bank, man. <laughs> not, not VBS, man. Can I get a lot of people in No, man. DBSA, the Development Bank. So, the DBSA. DBSA. So, uh, and then um, we consulted on investments. We consulted on finance and financial instruments. We consulted on a whole range of, 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 of practice areas, yeah. right, that actuaries might be involved in, right? So, we never really specialized. I never really specialized in consulted retirement funds. So the, comp the, the, the consulting firm I worked at was, uh, it, uh, it had a sort of subsidiary that focused on retirement fund consulting. So consulting to retirement funds, yeah. right? So, and it was quite interesting because then, I mean, a lot of people who get into the job market, they might have a very soft landing. So 
you get into a job, there's many people that are above you that can mentor you, that can help you uh, develop and progress. So we started in this consulting firm and it's like, boom, you know, day one, it was a one-man show that we joined. It was me and this guy straight from Varsity. You get start working immediately, right? Wow. Running numbers, writing entire reports to clients. And that was quite a rough start. I mean, I mean, for someone who's very wet behind the ears. And at the time, we're working for someone who's very... It was the deep end. Yeah. Can was, I get... it, was it the deep end, like? Yeah, deep end type thing. And I mean, it was... When you're working for someone who's very intelligent, very, very intelligent guy. And he was quite a perfectionist as well. So you can imagine, you know. Um, how that was so there was no speciality as such yeah. right we consulted across the board which has also made it tough for me to pick what fellowship exam I want to do because most people who write a fellowship exam for the speciality that they work in if you work in a life insurance business you're going to write the life insurance fellowship exam if you work in a short term insurance business or yeah. non-life they call it non if you work in a non-life insurance business you're going to write the non-life fellowship exam if you do a, if you do consulting to retirement funds you're going to go and write the retirement fund uh, fellowship exam. There's six exams, right? And then there's a banking exam, there's a finance investment and medical aid, yeah. uh, medical aid schemes exam, a medical aid uh, exam. So we, because we consulted across all of these, you know, I, I felt like my strongest technical proficiency was in non-life. So I, I wrote the non-life fellowship, failed that, then tried the retirement fund did not pass that and haven't passed it yet so so can it so, can it actually take somebody like 10 years to get to get the qualification yeah, to qualify as a fellow as a fellow member, yeah, fellow the, member the quickest time is the quickest time is seven years okay but maybe the average would be like you're saying it could be could be 19 the average but the shortest would be so four yeah, your four year your four year degree with honors advice and then three years working experience while you're writing the other exams. Yeah. So there's two exam sessions per year. There's the there's the May, June sitting and then there's October, November sitting of exams. Okay. Yeah. So have you met anyone? Well, specifically, have you met anyone who passed in record time, never failed an exam, nothing, yeah. and you became a fellow member? A fellow member. I, I've never heard of someone who's never part, who's never who's yeah. never who's never failed an exam. So even the guy used to work like I say, he was very brilliant, one of the sharpest minds I know. Yeah. But even he had failed some of the some of the board exams, like one or two. So it's 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 it's, it's almost impossible to. I mean, I'm sure mm -hmm. there are people who have passed everything clean sweep, but it's 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 it's, it's highly unlikely. Improbable. I don't know anyone personally who did a clean sweep. You know, just boom 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 boom. It hardly ever hardly ever happens. Right. I mean, maybe to be remiss of me to not say that. That's why I started consulting. And then through consulting, through that consulting business, we consulted to a life insurance business that was owned by the investment arm of the trade union, NUMSA. So through that role, um, NUMSA wanted to appoint someone with my proficiency, a natural professional, to be a benefit coordinator. So that's uh, basically a role that involves... Um, safeguarding or safekeeping or having strategy around our members benefits right through dif uh, different retirement funds and medical schemes that yeah. our members might belong belong to and also someone on an ad hoc basis helps members with things that are within the ambit of my profession right yeah. so you find that uh, members will come and say there's an employee share scheme at work can you please advise us on it is it structured properly and through my experiences consulting things like employee share schemes we used to do valuations on them all the time so you know one became accustomed to seeing a lot of the documents and how they structured this one company we've got a lot of members in they were like no uh, we're looking to move from the time from the medical aid scheme yeah, to uh, medical aid scheme in way um how can we do that there's a lot of surplus in the scheme how do we deal with the surplus in the scheme Members will come on an ad hoc basis, their retirement benefits are on our APC and D. Some members will say if they're trying to change the bonus, which is not really traditionally actuarial, something like yeah. they're changing the bonus structure, like how is it fair, you know what I mean? And it's not really something actuarial, but if you just apply your mind, I guess, you know, you cannot be able to assist them to solve their problems. Yeah. Companies like mine, yeah. we do not have pension fund for our employees. Yeah. So how do you advise my employees? What what would you advise them to do? Yeah, look, um, I mean, there's a lot of avenues around this, right? So if you want, if you want savings for retirement, 
in the purest form yeah. and enjoy, to enjoy the tax benefits that come with it. Yeah. You have to probably invest in um, or, or pick one of the RAs or retirement annuities, right? A lot okay. of life insurance businesses offer that product, right? And, um, an RA. So you put a certain amount of money into the RA, they invest, you can choose the portfolio they invested in. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then you can only access the money though from age 55 from, a, from an RA, okay. right? That's what it's, that's the early retirement age that they said, unless you can prove permanent or you can go for ill health retirement, so permanent disability that prevents you from pursuing the job that you're trained for. Yeah. And then that's with RAs and things like that, that are recognized savings, retirement savings uh, platforms. Let me show you approved. And approval means that they're approved actually through the, the Income Tax Act. They get the tax benefits. Yeah. But there's other ways you can save for retirement, right? They're unapproved schemes. Like when I was working in the consulting firm, because it's a small business, uh, I just had unit trust that I was putting my okay. money into. I didn't enjoy the tax benefits, but they had the the flexibility of when I can access the money when I want. So it's just you can find and and any 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 sort of platform that can save towards retirement. You know, you're saving for retirement. But if you want some an approved scheme, yeah. it has to be stuff like uh, retirement annuities where they'll get the tax benefits, right? Okay. But what you find is that some companies. Particularly if you've got a decent sized workforce, they can join umbrella funds, umbrella retirement funds. And those retirement funds are also set up by corporates. So it's a lot of different employers participating okay. inside the retirement fund. And then with a lot of these type A retirement funds, each participating employer can have different sub rules. They can have different contribution rates, different uh, whatever rules. And then there's main umbrella fund rules as well. Yeah. So that's one way of doing it. But obviously, and I'm saying employees with a decent sized workforce because obviously there's a lot of admin that also comes with setting yeah. up that even though you're in an umbrella time and fund, right? You have to okay. set it up through your HR, your payroll systems and all that other jazz. And you have to have someone who's an officer that, someone in management who's an officer, someone who's sort of looking after safeguarding or is a custodian of that yeah. umbrella fund, even though you don't have a fund in yeah. the, the, the fund in the, the employer itself. And you find that even, I mean, uh, it's becoming quite a popular move that a lot of even big employers are now moving towards the umbrella funds, right? And the regulator, uh, or the regulator of retirement funds, né? they are the the FSCA. They actually are consciously trying to get less than a hundred funds in the country, right? As things stand, they're about it could be just under ten thousand. There are a lot that are dormant, dormant, mm -hmm. dormant as well in that in that number. But still, a lot of retirement funds. But they want to get it under hundred, and the reason is they want to be able to to actually monitor the conduct. Or pol police is a strong term, but monitor the conduct of retirement funds closer. So if you've got lesser numbers, you can monitor the conduct more than if you've got big numbers. When, when they say the conduct, it's yeah. When they say the conduct, it's the conduct of the fund, right? But the fund. The fund is run by the trustees. So most, the buck, the buck in a retirement fund would always, almost always stop at the trustees, right? Of the retirement fund. But that when, well, but they monitor the fund, right? But when you monitor the fund, it's almost like the, where you, where you squeeze and, and tighten the screws a bit is on the trustees who run the fund. Okay. Yeah. What do you think about stock fails, Zabokas? Money saving schemes, is that? Look, they've got, they've got their merit, right? I mean, uh, People would normally ask, you know, do you, where can you put money in a stock file to get generate good returns? And I'm like, there is no, there is no generate good returns without risk, right? Yeah. And that's what people don't understand, right? So you could, you could have a stock file that invests in crypto. That's hella risky, but you could get good returns. You know, if you tell people not put in a unit trust, they, it's not exciting, but it's like, well, you know, if you put it in an equity strong portfolio, for anything above five years, if you don't touch it, yeah. you get decent returns, right? Yeah. Equities have proven to be in the long term, you know, uh, give yield better returns than other asset classes. Might not seem exciting or, or you know, sexy, but it, it it's definitely you know something where uh, where, where you get returns. So they've they've got their merit. I mean, besides the other operational risks that come with a stock fail, you know, that you have to trust in more individuals than it than this they're not institutionalized and you have to trust individuals. Yeah. You know, there are always those issues that, you know, I can't I can say that the risk also lies with that. People can run with can run away with their with money the cash, yeah. with the cash. Yeah, but they've got their merit, I think, in terms of aggregating uh, funds and so forth, you know. Look it, it and it also depends what that stock fail is trying to achieve, right? Yeah. Is it uh, I mean I mean some people do stock fails for 
for funeral benefits, right? Mm-hmm. And a stock fell, the, 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 the mechanics of the stock fell are no different to the mechanics of an insurance company because an insurance company, lots of people pay premiums, but those that don't claim subsidize the ones that do claim, okay. right? So in a stock fell, when you sort of libotachel it together, mm-hmm. right? Some, of, some people use it for, if they use it for funeral benefits, mm-hmm. You know, it sort of uh, uh, it has that benefit that um, of uh, the benefit of the mediation, benefit of the mediation of, of, of funds or aggregating funds, right? And look, it does have its benefit. Uh, it's not. Besides, I think the biggest issues I think that people would have with that probably is to is to is is, is the operational risk that come with it. You know, people running with money or things failing like that. You know. And I think also the, the the financial services industry is going to or trying to formalize and or regulate also stock files and friendly societies, right? Okay. Um, so yeah. So now, okay. is it viable for Motoraba Belelo? What are the chances of winning? Well, the chance of hitting the jackpot are one in fourteen million. <laughs> so Chad, there's a very good chance you're never gonna win the lot. You're never gonna win. The no, you can. I mean, there's look. Some people play it for altruistically, thinking that I it's a, a big portion of the, 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 the generated revenue has to go towards charity. Yeah. So some people look at it as, well, it's the worst thing, worst case scenario, I'm, I'm donating to charity, so to speak, uh, even if I don't win. So if you want to, if you want to, if you're playing it with hopes of winning the jackpot, no, then you, you're just throwing money down a thing. But you can win it. I mean, it's a 1 in 14 million shot. So I, you know, I always tell my friends, Gokas, Gore, if you span a span, you say, we work at a retail store, right? Mm. And then you want to make your family rich. I always suggest, okay, buddy, just get a life insurance. Pay that 600 bucks. And then you'll get two point something. When you die, your family gets that. And then you leave uh, a will that will instruct on how the money will be used or whatever, whatever, whatever. That's what, that's what I always tell people. Is it good advice? Because regardless, in any way, we use it. Look, um, yes, yes, and no. Okay. So maybe the maybe the, the the premise or the basis of giving the advice to say that it's it's a way to make money. Life insurance isn't. It's a risk product. Yeah. It's a risk so product. it's it's not an investment product, right? So then, what then you have to ask yourself is, and not to say you shouldn't get it. I think you should get it. But what you need to ask yourself then is, okay, if 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 there are people who are dependent on me yeah. being alive for their livelihood, right? And what would happen in instances that I'm not around anymore, mm-hmm. right? Uh, what then, you know, what then, how do they then get provided for, yeah. right? And then that's that's one of the benefits. You say, okay, then you get a life insurance policy and say, okay, this is the payout. I think that you said at whatever level, but however, also life insurance can test whether they can almost mean says that you're not overinsured as well, right? I mean, you can't, you can't have, it, it raises, it raises a bit of a risk, right? It raises a bit of a risk if, if let's say you've got a, a very a general worker and you've got a 25 million life cover you know yeah that almost raises the risk that this person is so overinsured that uh, if you know someone could have motives to off them because yeah. their life that the income that they're going to generate for their life being there for them staying alive would be nowhere near the value yeah. Of, yeah so someone might think so it raises a bit of a risk in that sense right People can select against the insurer, but if you are saying you are protecting your beneficiaries, right, yeah. uh, against loss of future in your loss of future income, yeah. then yes, surely you must get life insurance, right? If someone has a family business, if if you've got a family business and, you, and the father and the family business is the key man in that business, if he dies, the business doesn't run. Surely you should get a life insurance cover for that. It's okay. There's going to be a loss of income. We might have to shut up shop or whatever, you know. Maybe get life insurance against that against his life. But then also sometimes humans are also driven by uh, what they call a bequest motive. So a motive okay. to just leave things behind for someone, yeah. right? So maybe if I use my example, uh, uh, I, 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 I don't think there's anyone who's a direct beneficiary of mine dependent on me staying alive, right? But yeah. I, do have, I do have cover uh, the event that I do die, you know, maybe my beneficiary would be my my parents my brother's got a young family you know yeah. that's more of a bequest motive you know people are driven by that and okay. in those instances generally sometimes people would set a bit of a lowish premium i mean lowish cover level of cover but it's, it's not a bad idea but i mean it's a, to get life insurance but then maybe someone probably have to sit there and do some sort of needs analysis 
if that makes sense, right? Yeah. And and if you look at their needs, so if you are talking about someone who's got a family business, go kasi, you know, should probably get life insurance cover, you know, against some of the lives that could probably be key lives in the business operating. But it's not an investment product at all. So not putting like so you're not putting money into into a life insurance policy to try get something out of a big return. In any way, if it's your life that's being sure, you're not gonna get anything. Yeah, you, yeah. definitely. It's like would, planting a tree that yeah. you're never gonna sit under. Yeah. But which also raises the issue of with the with the life insurance companies, a concept they call insurable interest. So I can't I can't I mean, you know, we me and you when someone looks at you and I, the connection yeah. between our your our lives is is tenuous at best. Right. If I take a life insurance policy out on you, it's a bit suspicious now because yeah, then is. I can get you, you know, out, yeah. to get trouble. I don't have insurable interest in you staying alive. Who's that lady? Rosemary. Rosemary. She was a, but you see, she 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 yeah, but you see, she would have actually they tightened the screws on that, but she would have probably passed the insurance insurable interest test because these were family. You don't yeah. think you, you don't naturally immediately assume that someone's gonna off someone in their family for the money. So if you're saying I'm insuring my husband, my wife, my spouse, my kids, it's not something to question. Yeah. If I'm insuring a random person, it's an, um, you know, do you have insurable interest in them staying alive? You know. Oh well, yeah. So now, can you give us examples of how you help insurance companies like calculating their policies or monthly premiums? Okay, I mean it's a it's a very technical question, I guess. But the sim the 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 the, 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 the if I if I make it very simple in layman's terms, yeah. what most life insurers would do, they would take the data that they that that, that they have on book, mm -hmm. right, and then that data would inform the expected claims okay. that they pay. Right. So if they've got, if I've got, without getting to technical, so if I've got a book, 10 years worth of insurance claim data now, let's say in a, to simplify, 10 years worth of claims data on the Corolla, the Uber, yeah. yeah. I can say that roughly per annum, I'm paying out this much, right, on those mm -hmm. claims. If I say I'm paying out roughly per annum 10 million on claims on those Corollas, and I've got a million Okay, million maybe so there are hundred thousand uh, policyholders at that Corolla. We divide it by that amount to say, oh, roughly this is how much the premium would be. However, there's a lot of risk rating, right? Yeah. That's that's now where it gets very complicated in, in, in non life insurance. So what happens is that they can take that data and use what they call linear regression. So they take that data, take all the risk factors of all the policyholders, right? Yeah. And then with that you map out factors. Yeah? The fact you map out factors. Uh, you map out the price based on the risk factors uh, that you get from your data, right? So you can use age, you can use uh, location, you can use experience, driving experience, whether they're male or female, which is a rating factor in South Africa. But they've 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 since they've since uh, removed it in Europe. Actually, you can't discriminate on gender in terms of short-term insurance. But anyway, you use all those factors, those those factors, and you run a predictive model on how those factors affect the risk. Right, okay. so you can say you can easily say okay, males claim more than females, right? So naturally, then when you start applying those risk factors, you know, to the individual that's applying or the policyholder, then you can come up with the rate and the price. Wow, it's a lot though. It's like you see, my my, my Malema, yeah, Malema wants to start a, st a state bank. Yeah, why is it so hard for black people to start their own banks? Well, firstly, firstly, you need a hundred million sitting with the Reserve mm -hmm. Bank. Uh, just sitting there's capital to get a banking license so let's start there uh, cool. you know so so i mean i mean it's the same thing i think earlier you know was asking me if i'd ever start my own insurance company and i was like varam cop <laughs> that's who i was talking to Straight up. so um and 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 even there i mean the minimum for an insu for for insure for to get an insurance license the minimum capital you need to hold is 15 million Right, that's the minimum capital minimum. when you apply for the for an insurance license, unless it's micro insurance. So if you're selling, just like funeral policies, there the the minimum uh, capital requirement is far lower. But in general, the capital requirement is quite high. So with with a banking license, I don't know about the other technical tick boxes you might have, uh, but you need a hundred million sitting with the reserve bank sitting there as unencumbered capital to get a banking license. Let's start there. So I mean. That's why you're not gonna get banks sprouting all over the show. Yeah, I see. But I can't talk to any other technical pro think tick boxes 
you know, like with insurance businesses, you have to apply, you have to apply at the FSEA with the business five year business plan, projections of your of your business, that uh, show that you're gonna have adequate capital. And then on that application itself, then they'll grant you the license if they feel that um, if they feel that it's um it's viable, right? Yeah. So I, I think our I think our the regulation of particularly the insurance industry, in fact our financial services industry as a whole. It's quite strict. It's quite. It's, it's probably probably some of the strictest in the world, right? To my knowledge, right? And that's probably why you would never get. We do have corporate failures, but you don't have spe- as spectacular corporate failures in the financial service sector of this country because yeah. it's quite strict on the capital requirement. I mean, even even in the global financial crisis of 2008, we had very few financial services businesses shutting shop as opposed to say something somewhere in the US yeah. where they where their financial where their regulation is not as strong. So so they're even applying for a license, right? It has to be so strict. They have to make sure that you know it will be financially sound for the policyholders that are you know that are taking up this product. It creates this monopoly of the banking system because most people that are employed are forced to open up the bank account. Look, and perhaps perhaps that's that's where that's where the merit of argument uh, at Julius is that you know because of that restriction that people might never open a bank and it's valid, right? But it's also the same it's the same example that I use with insurance, right? That you need to have that cap, minimum capital requirement of 15 million. But that 15 million is to safeguard the policyholders, to say that that capital capital requirement that capital requirement is uh, it's a buffer against experience being worse than expected, right? If I you just ask me the question now that how do you calculate the premium on a motor vehicle insurance policy? Now? I price it using my data and expected outcomes. But what if the outcomes are worse than expected? When we had the hailstorms here in Midrand and thingy, mm. those are outcomes that are worse than expected when you're calculating. But you need to have a bit of buffer and capital for those uh, required for, for for those instances where things are, are are worse than expected. Right now, with banks, what people they're, they're afraid of what they call a run on banks, right? Which is why you need to have such a big capital. A run on banks basically is all the depositors coming today and getting their money back. But you've mm-hmm. borrowed a bulk of the a bulk of the money that goes through a bank is not sitting with the bank. They borrowed it. They lend from you. They take your deposits. They borrow it to someone else. The borrowers are not going to rush to pay you back. But the mm-hmm. depositors and tomorrow, if all depositors come and want their money, you must give them their money. That's how Samba Bank failed, failed, right? So that's that's why sometimes there's those big capital requirements as well. And look, there are barriers to it. They 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 they, are, they definitely become barriers to entry, right? And perhaps maybe that's a bit that's the case. That Malema is trying to make, you know, in terms of black people owning or having their own bank. Sorry again. I I, yeah. I mean, with the hundred million is a number that I've I've known to to be the number for a number of years. So it could have changed actually. So perhaps if anyone's listening out there, they can check. But it's 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 a lot. It's a lot of millions. It definitely goes up it, in, from hundred. Pro- probably probably has gone up. But yeah. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. What are the misconceptions about your career? Other than being a social sociologist with a calculator, yeah. who said that? <laughs> you know who said that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, <laughs> I definitely know who said that. Look, the big—I mean, like I said, I, I said at the very start, the biggest misconception is that it's 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 all about numbers and math and so forth, right? Yeah. Um, it actually isn't. It's it's problem solving, like you said, it's problem solving in finance. Yes, and in finance, it, it means numbers, but you need to problem solve, right? Which yeah. isn't just running numbers, numbers and so forth. You need to understand the problem and communicate the results and the implications thereof in your profession, right? Whether it's a client, whether it's someone in the business that you're working in, right? So the biggest misconception is that it's all about um, numbers, I think, you know? Uh, And that's why a lot of people get tripped up. The communication is not on par, it's not proficient enough, right? The the biggest misconception maybe about the people is that they might feel that uh, they're socially awkward and nerds. I think that, <laughs> like 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 any professional yeah, in one in society, there's a, there's a wide spectrum of people uh, there as well, you know. So you do get some that are socially awkward, and the people that are more socially awkward, they tend to work in the back office. You do get actual professionals who work in the back office and would rather just be calculating the numbers and not client facing or not right, yeah. interacting a lot with people. Uh, you do get a lot. I mean, but if you want to work in like consulting, where I used to work, you need to you need to definitely need to uh, have a character that can face clients not socially awkward not afraid to stand up and speak in front of people so the, the misconception is that you know it's probably re- about the people maybe that they are socially awkward recluses and i think it's a wide spectrum 
But I think it's not all about maths. Uh, it's not just about maths and numbers and number yeah. crunching, you know. Another big misconception maybe, but I think it's because, not misconception, but some people think that it's the same as, a, as an accountant or CAs. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's a bit different, it's I think. I think with the, with, with, the, with the accounting profession, there's more, when you look at an organization, there's more backward looking, right? And then with the actual profession on the, 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 the finances or the financial health of an organization is more forward looking, yeah. right? Because you're looking and saying, okay, these are the obligations forward and I'm solving for those, right? But you need to, you need to be very, that's being said, uh, in the profession, you need to be very comfortable with reading financials and uh, the books of a company of a business or an, uh, uh, i mean with retirement funds you know every quarter you sit board meetings there's management accounts of the fund as well you know there's uh, annual financial statement you actually have to be very comfortable with you know how they're structured the different items which could be different from organization to organization but you need to be comfortable around that as well yeah people get comfortable in companies and they start stealing you know fraudulent and all that so when have you experienced such a nature or are you a part of such a thing would you like to a potential investor look and, and i mean and i mean i mean and and maybe i maybe a lot of it will be self-preservation in my response but it's an honest response i think with a lot of professions that are very hard to attain or get to know because of this because of the strife to get to it you will do everything to protect its integrity to protect to protect that uh, that designation that you've achieved ne? okay so They'll, you, in most professions, I think even with the accounting profession, they'll hold, you'll hold yourself to a very high standard, right? Or should, rather, yeah. right? So I know with a lot of actuaries, you cannot, if you're if you found to be dishonest in any way, you will lose your, your, your yeah, qualification. And you will never, with, with certain uh, misdemeanors, you, will ne you might not even be able to be readmitted yeah. at all, right? So if I fraudulently went and, 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 and sometimes, they, I mean, there have been a lot of cases about, let's say in a life insurance business, right, there's this, calculation they call an embedded value one of the most important calculations in a life insurance company the embedded value goes towards valuing the business it goes with 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 with, with executives yeah. that number feeds into the bonuses that they could make the bonus pools they could make so if you could make if you make a very unsound or unreasonable assumption around something like a discount rate yeah. one interest rate you are using in your calculation if it's too high the embedded value goes too low bonuses could be affected but if you are if, if if it's found that you then made an unreasonable assumption uh, that could have led to that you know it could lead to you using a certificate to your accreditation and you might not even be able to come back so i think the the the, the, the fact that you need to you know you need to uh, to protect yourself and your profession right you, you you wouldn't certainly knowingly you know do anything dishonest in your job and dispensing which i'm not saying in your private life stealing someone yeah. from a group but i'm saying in terms of a profession you know you'd never do that right and i mean i i mean I, there was a situation i had at uh, at work recently some members came and they were like the company had was bought out by another company you know, and and according to the labor laws the benefits that they got when they take over when when that takeover happened cannot reduce the, wow. the benefits now and then however the company that they, the company that bought them was using a cost to company uh, basis as opposed to basic salary basis right in terms of when they in terms of their payroll and reporting so so what happens cost to companies that these guys né, these guys when they look at their payslip it looks as if they're getting less but they're not really because there are other benefits because this one is cost to company right and here they were wake they're working on basic plus whatever whatever you know but then these members had in the time and this was over years the, this case was from 2011 these members had gone to some other accounting firm and and this some this guy did some did some bogus a bogus calculation but just wrong and lazy you know what i mean so the society does have some powers to take uh, a certificate some you can take some revoke someone's qualification certificate but most the more the 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 the, the, the more formula recognized if, if if that's the right term um body that someone reports to is the fsca so the financial yeah financial uh, sector conduct authority right because uh, if it either be an actual retirement fund or life insurance business or whatever that's where you report them right um you could report if it's not if they're working in the banking or investment banking uh, i'm not too sure where you know maybe you could take your recourse there uh, i'm not aware of i'm not aware of direct 
reports from i mean I, a lot of these disciplinary issues do come to the society but i'm not i have direct sort of reporting like um like right. like, like like a policyholder going and say i think the security did something wrong to mm-hmm. that you know I, 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 yeah yeah I, th- I think mostly that would come be a complaint it'd probably be a complaint to the to the ombudsman uh, and then maybe the investigations then they'll find that okay the security what what and then maybe that case then go to the society but I'm, i mean i'm not speaking on total good uh, good authority on that but i'm just saying i think with most industries it'd be financial service conduct authority where someone can be reported and making money is a risk mm. all in all so why do people who handle so much money not invest in small businesses well i mean you just answered yourself when you said making money is a big risk but it is look i mean it's 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 it, it, it's it's a big risk right so at the end of the day if you're sitting there as a trustee of retirement funds so i'll talk about retirement funds as the biggest institutional investors second biggest institutional investors something like uh, uh, insurance businesses right insurance businesses are not going to invest in very risky assets because it's going to be a strain on their capital requirement so you see that capital requirement i talk about a 15 million yeah you do a capital calculation based on uh, the policies that you have on book and the risk that you run. Generally, the bigger the insurer, the bigger the capital requirement that you need. Part of that calculation, the capital charge that comes into that calculation is how risky your investments are. Now, if your investments are very risky, you're going to have a bigger capital charge. So your net, basically your net assets, right? Uh, just to put it in simple terms, would be the capital, right? There are, there are other definitions that's not strictly just the net asset, but I'm just saying, just to give you an idea of what the capital would be. So the net assets, assets minus liabilities, that's the capital. That requirement, the minimum level of it, if you've got risky assets in there, that minimum requirement becomes higher, right? The minimum level you need to hold, right? That you need to hold. So they, they might not want to get into very risky assets being small businesses, right? Small businesses fail. They didn't fail a lot. So, I mean, I mean, anyone will tell you, they'll say that the, the venture, what is it, the failure rate of venture capital is at 80%, if not 90? Yeah, 80%, Oof. one in one, what, four in five failures, you know, and that's, now you can imagine in a retirement fund, your first port of call in a retirement fund is to safeguard the benefits of members, yeah. right? These members put their contributions for 40 years or so forth in their retirement funds. Hopefully they'll grow with, the, with, with some sort of return, right? And in the environment that you are in, most retirement funds are defined contribution funds, right? Meaning yeah. that members put money into the retirement fund, they grow with their investment returns, then they get a certain pot of money when they retire, right? Mm-hmm. Now, it works out that the, 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 the return that they need to generate over those years to get 75% replacement ratio. So to get to buy a pension that's 75% of their last salary to afford a pension mm-hmm. at that level, you need a return consistently over that 40 years that they invested plus minus of about CPI plus five, CPI plus five. Now, that's the return that the assets have to generate underneath. Now, fa- a failing business, well, no. that's a return of minus 100%. It's gone. It's kaput, you know? So, you, you, the issue then with the retirement funds, that's why they can't dispense a lot of their money in risky businesses, right? There's a limit to how much they can invest in, say, private equity or private debt, right? That goes towards small businesses. But also what you find is that retirement funds don't won't directly invest in these businesses. They'll give it to asset managers. And these asset managers, well, let's say it's a private equity manager, they get funds from various funds or institutional investors. They put them together. They've got a pipeline of projects or things they're going to invest in, right? Yeah. So those generally would be the guys who you could talk to about giving small businesses money. But even them, they've got their own risk tolerances. And they'll be like, no, I'm not willing to... No, my fund. I promised my, I promised my investors that this is going to have an IRR of uh, CPI plus ten. I'm going to shoot yeah. the lights out, and you can't be giving a lot of uh, failing businesses, right? Some up uh, generally, they could be venture capital type businesses, but those type of businesses would not probably take or be funded from institutional investors like retirement funds, you know, because their risk tolerance is very low, yeah. you know extremely low i think the, the the duty of care of trustees on retirement funds is probably that one of the highest duties of care because you are safeguarding what is the biggest asset of most people besides their house when they reach, when they reach retirement 
So the long and short of it, it's it's it, it, it's going to be very difficult to try get an institutional investor like retirement fund business to try give small businesses money. Uh, they can through asset managers, but then that has to be a small, like small, small portion of their portfolio, yeah. right? And you know that's, that's sadly the, the reality of it. Yeah. So so there's 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 this uh, framework called Regulation uh, Twenty Eight you know, of the Pension Funds Act. They've got limits uh, limits as to what you can invest, what a retirement fund can invest their money in. That's then that drives a lot of where the money would go, right? So a lot of it would be listed equity. Listed equity because it's seen as safer and liquidity of it, right? Bond market, bond market because bond markets also they uh, you're investing in assets, right? That are that are comparable to the liability, like bonds pay out coupons and you're paying out pension payments, right? And with a lot of bonds, so that there's liquidity, there's a there's a, there, there's an element of it being safe, right? You can invest in alternatives as well, like private equity, and they've increased the limit uh, that retirement funds can invest in private equity. But like I'm saying, the, the funds themselves, the retirement funds themselves don't directly invest in private equity businesses. An asset manager will come and say, "I've got, I'm raising a fund of two billion. I need I need institutional money. I need investors." They're the ones that would decide then the pipeline underneath the projects that they want to fund, right? Then uh, they go pick the projects, they go pick the investments, they come and sell it to us. But obviously, they, they we, we choose the ones, the asset manager we want. We don't choose the pipeline. So I'm not going to say to an asset manager, no, we're not a battle winner, but we want to invest in that housing project. You know, generally, that's not what they'll do, right? But I'm saying regulation 28 that drives that. So a lot of it is still listed equity, which is which 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 also is an important thing you're raising because the listed equity market can be saturated, right? It can it, it has its limits. Not like it, 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 it's an unlimited space. That's why there's been a bit of an increase in what in in, in the limit that funds can hold in private equity. But with that being said, with private equity, you know you 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 think that funds would still be a bit a bit skeptic about them because of the failure rate also, you know. Uh, because of the illiquidity of it, you know, you can't just exit if you want to, right? If you're investing in a private uh, equity fund, unless one of the investors buys you out, you find someone else to buy you out, you're riding it until the fund pays out, pays back, and they start paying back after seven, seven to ten years in the life of a private equity fund, right? So that's where the bulk of the money, you know, would go, right? Into into sort of established um, into property as well, or property funds, your REITs and so forth. Um, you would have a small portion of it in cash. Because there are payments that go in and out of a fund, portion of it in cash if the manager or the consultants are moving money, moving money around. But that's where it would go, right? And it, look, and it's 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 a valid thing that you are you are raising around. Um, you know, you know, if the the, the biggest the, the biggest uh, accumulators of funds or assets, right? If they're not stimulating, if they're not investing to stimulate certain things, right? You can't allow the state uh, to stimulate a lot of the growth and infrastructure investment, which is why the government itself has called on retirement funds to look to invest in infrastructure to try kickstart, you know, or also drive the economy. You know, going forward, that they, they as a fiscal some themselves cannot handle that burden. You I, and I mean, it, it, a, bit, a bit of what could also be unfair with small business, they do fail, but even listed businesses have spectacular failures. The style of spectacular failure, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of retirement funds lost money. They try to sue this guy, and, and I don't know how that that, that 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 class action is going, but I think it's going to fail. But they that can happen as well, you know. But but funny enough, funny enough, with with Steinhoff as well, the underpinning issue was uh, some private equity businesses because they were overvaluing the private businesses that they had put in there right mm -hmm. and if you overvalue that if the money's not coming in once a bubble bursts you're like well you value these businesses at 10 million each they're like half a million each you know when that bubble bursts you know it bursts spectacularly and 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 on the on the on those big valuations all these execs were already they've already taken off their monies their bonuses they what what they don't retain in the business they're gone so like the rules and responsibilities of your job, like a typical typical day of an actual, what does it look like? Well, let me not maybe say my job because mine is not is not typical. Um, but uh, maybe I could give you my experience of working in consulting or what I do know, right? Yeah. So uh, there's many roles and responsibilities or roles that an actual can have, right? In the traditional sense, let's say if you were consulting or working in a retirement fund, right? Your biggest, the biggest deliverable in that job is is, is is the valuation report of valuing the fund right so depending on where you are in that process a typical day would change you get the data from the, fu the fund yeah. the membership data you check the membership data make sure that everything's fine clean it right 
build your models, run it through the models, run the numbers, run the scenarios, write the report, and then deliver, and then go and report uh, back to the client, right? So the typical day might perhaps be, depending on where you are on that project, right? Yeah. If you are reporting to a retirement fund or non-life insurance business. Yeah. If, you are, if you are someone who's working in pricing in an insurance business, right? Your typical day might be more typical every day in terms of uh, setting the prices, reviewing the prices if they are if they're adequate, um, reporting to management, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, the pricing and how it fits the profitability in the business and so forth, you know. So, so, so your typical day might depend on what you do basically, but also where about you be, you know, in terms of that project, right? So you could spend a whole day just uh, running models and running scenarios. You could spend a whole two, three days writing a report, you know. You could spend the whole day just cleaning out and, and checking data. But normally what would happen is that you, uh, you'd you also have a bit of a hierarchy. What do they call it? A, a chain of, you know, a reporting chain. So people lower down the reporting chain, the younger guys, we get them to do a bit of the data cleansing and what that and running of the models. And the guys that are more senior, you do more of the interaction with the clients. You know what I mean? They'll be there to get the instruction. Then say, okay, the younger guys, you can get the data, clean the data, which is what you do probably in your first yeah, you know, clean the data, run the models, uh, help with writing the report. I check the report, I support you here and there, and then I go and report back to the client. Submit, yeah. yeah. All right, that's dope. It's not bad. The bad part is studying all of this. So, industry sites, how do actuaries contribute to financial stability within companies and their growth? Yeah. So, I mean, the, st the stability itself, I mean, that's, that's what the profession is, right? You, the first port of call is calculating the liability and the reserves that they need to have, right? And even in calculating those reserves, you are very prudent in the assumptions you use, right? So if, if to give an example, if I think that to make all the claim payments on a book of policyholders is going to be the value of that is about a billion, yeah? I might be prudent and set assumptions such that it might come out to be 1.1 or 1.2 billion. But that extra... Uh, 200 million is just a buffer right okay. for adverse circumstances it's a buffer against if it's a life insurance policy it's a buffer against we have another COVID outbreak you might have more lives dying quicker than you would have expected on your books right or more lives dying in a period of time than you would have had on your books right so that's first first part of call is calculating the liability second part of call is uh, setting in in, 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 in in a retirement fund that's a defined benefit is calculating the contribution rate to meet those pension payments. In an insurance business, it's calculating premiums that are adequate enough to make that promise, right? If you calculate premiums that are not adequate enough, the business will fail. Okay. Because you're going to have to be dip into your reserves to pay out the policyholders because you, uh, you didn't price enough for the promise you made to pay those people claims. Okay. Right, the matching of the then you then you look at your liabilities against your assets, right? Then you advise on investing in assets that are appropriate to be able to meet the promise, right? So you're not gonna you're not gonna go and sell a policy a policy of motor insurance and then go and invest in like crypto. I'm just using very extreme examples of crypto, you know, because if it falls tomorrow and you have a hailstorm, you've got no money to pay people, True. right? So now giving the advice on what to be an appropriate strategy or the types of assets that they need to. Be invested in to be in a position to pay that uh, to pay those promises that they made to, to the policyholders, right? And and I mean the calculation, even the appropriateness of the assets, the calculation of the capital that you might need to hold as an extra buffer, as well, you know. So that's it's 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 basically the profession is built on being quite prudent, and 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 risk management in those organizations. So that that's that at the very core of it, it's it, it's it's to have that stability. Uh, in those businesses yeah. you you look out for the businesses basically well at the end of the day actually the, the biggest protection should be for the policy holders yes. right the policy hold no the biggest level of protection should be on the policy holders or the members of the retirement fund okay. not the shareholders not the so in, in an insurance company it's not the shareholders right yes you have to be mindful of their interest because you have to charge a, pr a premium also even even when you calculate a premium, there's a there's a portion you put for profit uh, for profit a profit loading for the shareholders to they provide the capital they must get a bit of return on it. Yeah. You do load for 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 return on capital, right? But at the end of the day, the protection is for the policyholders. Just to say that to the last cent, you shouldn't be able to pay the 
to the last rand, the promise that you've made to the policyholders for as long as the policies hold and enforce with this uh, with this uh, with this business. With in the retirement fund, it's even worse because there are no shareholders. The members are the shareholders, right? So your first point of call is to it's a protection of the members. Is AI gonna affect you like going to the future? Are there challenges like trends that are now challenging your profession? Look, I mean, technology technology is a disruptor in almost everything. I mean, firstly, let's take something like even Excel, yeah. right? Before, many decades ago, actuaries would probably have to do a lot of uh, rote or the calculations would be more, more manual than they are now and uh, as le less accurate because you could have to uh, maybe use averages or lump certain things together because you didn't have a computing power of say an excel right there's something that they used to call called the model points where you know you could take similar policy orders and treat them as one but the calculations are more manual and rote right and then you've got an excel which you know you could almost program and you've got certain uh, proprietary models that you can buy yeah. that do certain actuarial calculations right you just put the data in and the assumptions in setting of assumptions is a very key or cornerstone of the profession right you have to set reasonable assumptions around the calculations you're going to make and um, i don't know if an ai can replace that and probably can you know and it's a disruptor in everything yeah. Yeah. i mean you can get it you can get some people say you can get uh, your, your chat gtps to write reports even right? yeah it's true um, so so look it it it, it I don't think the profession would be immune to to the disruptions of, of, of technology. Okay. Yeah, like I said, I mean, the basic advancement like Excel, it advanced it advances the profession, but it could be could have been seen as a threat at the time okay. to people working and say, well, a computer can do what was maybe fifty percent of my job or thirty percent of my job, you know. With professionals, when they put a stamp on something, there's someone to hold accountable to the number that's there. There's someone to hold accountable to the financial soundness of that business. There's now, can you hold a computer program accountable to certain things? Maybe not. You know, it might come out the right answer, wrong outcome, or right answer, but at the wrong time, or communicated to the wrong audience, or come with an accurate answer, but could give a conclusion thereof that probably isn't appropriate. Who do you, would you hold accountable to uh, for that? No bad. So sometimes it's just that thing I would look. Um, even if we could do all of that, if it has to be a a natural person, and every all of all legislation that 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 talks to actuaries in certain jobs talk about a natural person, it has to be a natural person that doing ever. So when they sign off at the end of the day, they're the person accountable for that, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel you. I understand it clearly. So can you like can you quit your job? and go teach, become a mathematician? Well, no, maybe only at school. Oh. I, I mean, I did maths up to maths two at oh. varsity, so I can't be a maths professor. So how do you stay updated in latest trends, like the developments yeah. for, for, for the actual, actual science? Look, I mean, the various publications, um, the various magazines uh, for the profession, and just news about the financial services industry, right? If you go to the website of the FSCA, yeah. every time there's the, they take out circulars, you can find the latest circulars. A lot of them would affect the jobs, the, the job or the profession itself. There's a convention, there's seminars that they hold, every, regular seminars that they hold for different practice areas in the profession. We have a convention once a year. Um, so that's, you know, similar to almost any other profession. That's how you keep you know up to date with the trends and so forth you know can you share a project or an, an accomplishment in your career uh, that you are particularly proud of so i mean one of the one of the ones in the and at nomsa though like i said with yeah. is that they were trying to to move medical aid schemes and and the advice that i would have given them would have led them to having a contribution holiday of a year on their medical aid contributions because there's so much surplus sitting in the fund that they were they wanted to leave but if they leave it you have to leave the surplus in the medical aid scheme you don't take a surplus on the medical aid scheme across mm. so i was like look if you stay in here exhaust the medi exhaust the, the the surplus then move out because if you leave half of them are about to leave if you leave here you leave that surplus in the thing right mm. um so one of the ways to do it dissolve if you can dissolve that scheme if they dissolve the scheme, then on that day, then they can sh they can all share the members that they. But if you dissolve, it, they didn't. The guys who were staying didn't want to dissolve the scheme. Yeah. Right. So you know that they appreciate you know sort of that type of advice, members. You know that I mean, and that's direct. I mean, if you look at that and directly, 
impacts directly directly impacts um you know when it's got that tangible impact you say look if you stay there you can go a year without contributing to your medical aid scheme but your contributions are taken from the surplus and then you're oh, trying yeah. the surplus trying the surplus once it's dissolved then maybe move to another thing you know when someone sees that it's um it's it's quite and yet it's palpable right when you when you assist members like that i remember there's some project we did while i was still consulting some municipal councillors one of the pension funds were consulting to they were struggling to get a particular a particular valuation completed but that would have resulted in quite a lot of uh, surplus due coming to the members right yeah. and once we once we helped them complete that and we're getting their surpluses and it's like thousands of members you can just see how happy they are when they get their letters and like, oh man this is you know quite something you know and it's quite a it's 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 it's, it's, it's good you know that you see when you help people and especially the men on the ground you know they they they, they get quite uh, they get quite i mean i mean i mean they get quite you know you can just see the clear that they have yeah. on their faces you know what would you give a person in first year or a, a, a person aspiring to become a lecturer I would say that, uh, look, it, 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 when they say that it's going to take a lot of hard work and determination, I think the, 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 the element of determination is one that probably someone will overlook like a lot. Right? It takes a lot, particularly when you're going to come to the latter exams, right? Yeah. If you don't think that you can do that, uh, the, the, uh, working long hours and writing exams and that pressure, you can't have, you know. Uh, but also, if it's someone much younger who's aspiring to be nature, I think they must they must really understand what it is, and the misconceptions you spoke of, maybe ne, they must definitely clear iron those out. They must definitely know what it is, what it is they're getting themselves into, and have none of those misconceptions ever lie or left right once they yeah. So I, I think I think I think look, it's going to be very difficult, and if you if you if you think it's all about numbers and maths, no, don't do it. Get to understand what the profession is. Yes. yes. And then go and embark. And, and it is going to take quite a lot out of you. Um, something that they need to understand then as well. You know. How much does it cost to study? To study it. <laughs> well, I mean, the, 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 the cost depends on the, on the varsity fees, right? At, when, when you're doing the varsity program. And then the exams themselves are quite expensive. I think the fellowship exam, I mean, there's the exam itself, 10,000 or something. I don't know. I forgot. Now. There's the exam, but you also have to register as a student member. There's the material that you need to buy, and then, but most people, most employers, uh, will fund the exams, and uh, yeah, so at least that. But to a limit, so most employers to incentivize and to encourage their 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 their, their staff to pass the exams, they'll probably say we only pay for the exam twice. Oh, okay. If you fail it more than that, you pay for yourself after that. In your opinion, what sets apart a part, uh, successful actuary from others in your field? Some 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 actuaries tend to work in silos. So if you're in a practice area, you're very siloed about working in this practice area, right? Yeah. And I'd say that perhaps don't do that. And maybe I have that mindset because I started in consulting where, you know, consulted across the board yeah. and not in one particular practice area. And there's a lot of overlaps in a lot of some of these practice areas, right? And the one practice area when you're in finance and investments it encompasses all the other ones because all of these organizations have investments of assets that talk to the liabilities yeah. or the obligations they have right so yeah so i think I, i'd say that ones that are more broad in their mindset and scope and can think uh, not in a silo and also think in environment you know uh, think outside of the profession and say well you're in south africa right oh, okay. this these are these are conditions here that could be different to what your numbers your numbers can tell you one thing but then the situation around you you know or your country can say a totally different thing yeah. you know like if i give a stupid example if i'm going to calculate a premium or whatever and it's and, and it's a certain level technically that premium could be at that high level but you're like you're not going to sell this thing. no one's gonna no one's gonna wanna you know just have a, a, a good sense of you know you, you don't be too siloed about anything you know, good business sense and overall awareness what aspects of your work as an actuary do you find most rewarding, fulfilling, besides uh, the salary, of course? Now, I think for me, maybe not in terms of the profession, but my own experience, what I found rewarding was just not, it was never, I was never, I never felt like I was in a rut in terms of work, you know, in terms of there was always, there's always, every year there's always something new that I was doing that I hadn't done before, right? Even in this new role, that always, almost always, every year there's something that's new 
that I would have not. Sometimes it's not even in the ambit of what I I particularly would be trained for, but you know, a bit of application of your mind sometimes you know that can be something that's exciting and helpful but the dangerous part is you don't want to speak you don't want to come off as being a, a professional on something that you're not even if i'm just applying my mind you know like like one one other company like i said they were restructuring their bonus structure and mm-hmm. spanning and i mean that's not really they were asking if it's fair you know mm-hmm. and i was like well that's not really in the remit of my job but let's apply our minds and see you know if, if if this might be fair you know and it turned out that there was going to be a bit of a gap the, the company was using they were using they were using prospective uh, prospective numbers to calculate bonuses for the for the factory workers as opposed to retrospective so they wanted to move from that from retrospective to prospective and then they wanted to remove they didn't want to use company profits they just wanted to use factory outputs as well so it's just it's just like it's something very different i'm like you know it's not in the remit of my job but then maybe just apply your mind and you know you know help members where you can right but given given that that proviso as well that you know i might not be you know what's the hardest part about the job well it, it, it i think that the profession or the, the, the job itself so i think maybe let me talk to my own personal experience i yeah. think the job now the reward when i was in consulting the rewarding part was the hard part it's it's rewarding that you're always learning but that's that equally could be the hard part because if you're taking on you could take on something completely new that you've never done and it's easy to feel like you're it's beyond you know it's beyond you yeah. you've bitten off a bit more than you can chew and that can be quite something you know and if you're working in a, in a consulting firm it's like hey, hey, hey you need to you know and 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 be like there's no room for excuses you know you need to be on you your know, toes yeah yeah no you know it also just send you something hey we're doing we need to do this calculation here are the documents of the transaction go and calculate this thing for them just, okay i've never done this before i don't know what the hell this mm. could be you know and that can be quite difficult right and the difficulty also in in, in a changing regulatory environment if the environment is con- con- constantly changing you know with the uh, with regulation and stuff and that can bring itself bring with it quite a bit of a challenge right yeah and then at noomsa said the biggest challenging thing is trying to ride the balance or find a nice balance between maintaining your professional integrity and following an agenda right okay. like i gave you that anecdote about the members who thought that they thought and they vehemently thought that no they're being cheated by the company and you know they've lobbied and they've cheered up their local organizer they come to the office and they're like yeah no but and and you have to say look you want to be on their side but i don't i can't say where well, the way i look at it i can't say they are wrong yeah so where do you see the future of actuarial science heading, particularly in South Africa? Look, I mean, like I said, now, the, the, the traditional, the fields that actually is working keep evolving. So I'm saying now that they the, the evolve a lot of data analytics. You'll see, you'll probably see a lot of actuaries also getting involved in your own software engineering, perhaps having a bigger involvement you know, in terms of the AI that you're talking about. Yeah. And uh, certainly it seems like still there is a demand for the job. So in terms of, you know, job security or finding a job employability, I think it's still something that's that's viable, right? But uh, I think that's where the fields are now going to almost, uh, the wider field that could open is data analytics and software, AI, and so forth. I think that's where it's called. They're, they're, going to, they're going to also start, also move or being one very topical type, you know, point. You know. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you you heard it, all of it. It's a lot. So becoming an actuary is a lot. Kids, a lot. (laughs) It's a lot. It's not like becoming a bike. It's a lot. It's a lot. All right. Thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, and share. This is Rocking Lefati, signing out. Well, I mean, the long and short of it, I don't It might sound a bit cold and calculated, but it's probably safe. If it's gonna triple your money in a month, it's a Ponzi scheme. Like, look, there are, I'm, I'm sure there are business or things that you could do where you invest like a crypto or whatever that could do that. But generally, if you say invest in this and give us this money, it's gonna triple your money. It probably is a Ponzi scheme. His FX guy says they're gonna triple. It probably is a Ponzi scheme. It, I mean, it's you can make money off FX in the long term. Like good people, like good people who do it. But the people who sit in banks and it's their job to trade currency, they don't triple their money in a month, and it's their job on big balance sheets. 
So if it's no, I mean, and always ask yourself. We say you're gonna you know, trip your mind. What is what what is it that they're actually doing, right? So if you go to an Ellen Gray and you know trust, they'll tell you, okay, you can go online and they can tell you that Ellen Gray's equity fund. This is their strategy. This is the 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 the, 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 the tracking this index. This is how different they are from the index. Okay, so they invested in companies that are similar to the index. You go to the chase. Okay, they bought shares in this 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 and that. Okay, sure. That's where they put their money. They put those shares that are listed that you can see. If it's gonna triple your, I don't know, long and short. If it's gonna triple your money overnight, it's a, it's a scheme. It's a Ponzi scheme.